Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my living, well, my study. Um, usually I give these presentations in the shed, which is away from my cat. So I'm going to apologize straight away if you hear some whinging going on. Um, that's not me or my stomach. So um, today I'm going to give a really brief introduction to uh, the, the subject of the inside out of flies. So I work here, in this beautiful building here, and um, most of you, I presume, would have been to it at one point in your life. But um, a lot of people don't realize that although it's known for its bones and stones, actually the museum houses quite a lot of other, in my opinion, way more exciting material, including the flies. We have millions of flies and I've been very lucky to be working there for the last 15 years, um, working on species descriptions, working on all sorts of other things. And I have become rather obsessed by them to say the least, but I, I'm not alone. And I haven't been alone for hundreds of years because some of the earliest examples of people studying flies are great examples such as Robert Hooke. Um, I'm sure a lot of you would have his book. I have one of the earlier copies with the fold out diagram and it's an absolute treasure. And this man was obsessed with looking at all sorts of things that were very obvious and very close to us. And one of the things he started really looking at was the insects and with those, lots of flies because obviously they're the best animal to get close and personal so thanks to the a newfangled invention called the microscope he was the first to really start drawing them in detail so here we have on the left an absolutely fabulous image of a uh horsefly head Ooh. wow oh now hold on oh it's gone on but um, we are able to use new technology to actually look at this even further. So those eyes that you saw previously, now we can look at closer. And this is a housefly head or, or something very similar. This is probably the closest that most people will want to get to a lot of these species, but they're absolutely fascinating. And so one of my ideas was to actually start to write about how much we know and how much we don't know about all their different features, such as their antennae such as what's going on with their vision, such as all their head now. So what is a fly? Well, a lot of people get confused because the common names seem to say everything. So you can have things like scorpion flies, dragon flies, and all of these, and they're not a fly. A true fly is an insect which is meant to as an adult, and I say meant to, because the lovely thing about flies is they've taken that blueprint, the basic morphological thing that they're meant to be, and just laughed in the face of nature. So an adult fly is meant to have suctorial mouth parts. So you can never be bitten by a fly. You can be maimed, sucked, sliced, pierced, you name it, but you cannot be bitten by a fly. They're meant to have yeah, one pair of wings that. as an adult. Yes, um, that's, you know, flies, flies, they fly, but not all of them have wings, which is quite amusing. And they have one pair of full pairs. And these are these gyroscopic um, balancing organs that enable flies to become arguably some of the best uh, pilots on the planet. They are extraordinary with their ability to loop the loop, fly backwards, land upside down, everything about them. Now those three things, I tell you, lots of flies don't have them. They're not called walks, but they are very funny, um, very odd looking um, organisms that are able to modify themselves completely to the environment. And this is what's enabled this group of animals to become some of the most diverse and some of the best explorers on the planet. But it's not just the adults we've got to think about when we look at them. This little cutie, this little curious creature staring at you right now is in fact the backside of a crane fly. Okay, and it's the larval stage. So most people forget about this stage, although this is arguably the most important stage because this is generally the feeding stage of a fly. And it's often in places where the adults don't live. So they've done complete niche separation, enabling them to get to different habitats and do different things within our environment, which makes the fly so useful. But the morphology of them as this larval stage is basically, as I describe it, they're like vegetable soup in a sleeping bag. They are very basic because all they really need is a mouth, an anus and a massive gut. But they have enabled us to do all sorts of things. So you would have been used to, or hopefully would have seen this little maggot in your garden. Obviously, you have to be hanging around your compost bin quite a lot or hanging around a 
uh, decomposing uh, something that's not very pleasant, which I often find myself doing, because this is a rat-tailed maggot. And this, those little cute spiracles we saw in the last one, actually has one massive elongated spiracle here that enables it to be able to, to take oxygen from above the surface of the water or whatever that environment it is, and then dangle down and feed because they just feed with their head end and breathe with their bum. But these larvae are doing an amazing thing. They're getting rid of a lot of material in the environment we don't like. And then once they've metamorphosized, once they've reorganized their body for heat use and the adults popped out, this adult now lives in a completely different environment. It flies around and it is a hoverfly. And these hoverflies are some of the best pollinators on the planet. Everyone ignores flies, but they themselves have modified so many of their body parts to enable them to be such efficient pollinators. Also, some of them migrate from Africa to the UK, transferring pollen along the way. So this is great for the genetics of a lot of plants, especially those in relic populations that are hidden, because these hoverflies can fly very high and able to see these dispersed populations of plants below. And look at them, they love pollen. They're a bit messy. I think that's why I like flies in a way, because they're just a little bit grubby, but they have to clean themselves regularly. So they often talk about hoverflies being bee mimics, and I'm not sure I would totally go along with this, because in some ways it could more be an example of convergent evolution. They're both doing the same thing. They're both getting into the flowers, so they both must be really her suit to enable the pollen to stick to them. They've got many modifications on their body. They don't have the uh, baskets that bees do, but they often they have pollen combs to enable them to brush the pollen forward to their mouth. Now, they're not like bees. They don't have to go back to the hive every night. Nope, this lot can just stuff their faces. So even though they don't take maybe as much pollen, they're really good. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about the body of a fly. We're gonna talk through the head bit, which is where most of the sensory organs are, the thorax, which is where a lot of the locomotory organs are, and the abdomen, well, that's where the fun bits are. So we start off with the head. The most amazing organs on the head are, that we can see are what we can see with the eyes. And they have very, very, uh, they have up to seven eyes just to start off with. But the two large ones are the compound eyed, made up of thousands of individual eye facets called omatidium. Now, unlike all the other insects, which have within their omatidium, they have one huge light sensory cell. In a fly, they're not happy with this. So that has then broken back up to individual cells. And as you go down, if you see on the left, you've got a series of five images. That is taken throughout one of these sensory cells at different heights. So you can see that the reflectors are at different positions. So one image now can take seven, six different images within it. Uh, sorry, one cell can take six different images. So although they may not have as many facets as, say, a dragonfly, which has up to 30,000, they have way more images going on in one eye. So it's really complicated and really complex, but it gives them the greatest acuity of the insect. So when you try and hit a fly, it just laughs in your face and goes, well, that's slow motion. I can see that and move on. If you want to catch a fly, you've got to go slowly so they don't take up on what's going on. The number varies, the size varies, depending on the sex and depending on the flirty nature of the fly. Because you're getting to get to know this during my talk, that flies are arguably the flirtiest of all the animals. And they don't just use their eyes for seeing, they use their eyes for flirting. Now, this is the stork-eyed flies. So many modifications have gone on the flies. And this has happened independently, it's evolved independently over 20 times in flies. They are so incredibly plastic when it comes to doing things like this. And what is fascinating is during the pupil development stage, when they're going through this reorganization of body tissue, you can see the optic nerve developing. And it develops as a very coiled spring that when they are actually merged, it pops out. Mouth parts. Everyone goes on about the mouth parts of flies. Not all adults have mouth parts because Again, the larval stage is the one that has been involved with the feeding. This little adorable creature, so everyone's like, oh, it looks like a bumblebee, how sweet. It's actually the reindeer bot fly, and it squirts its larvae up into the nostrils of a reindeer. 
arguably this is probably why Rudolph had his very red nose. And what they do is the larval stage is just solely about the eating. The adults don't need it. The adults have to concentrate on just mating. Now often they have a very dispersed host with the larval that they have to just do that, get on with it. But mouth parts of some creatures you do know very well, such as this little mosquito. I arguably think this is one of the insects that most people hate. But what's really cool is that we're taking what we hate and we're actually doing some very smart developments with it, such as smart needles. So when the mosquito mouth part pierces the skin, first of all, it's able to do so in such a way that you don't detect it. It's very rare that you feel it when she's piercing you. You may feel it afterwards when you get the histamine reaction because what she's doing is the mouth part is gently vibrating, obviously a little bit faster than I can do. And by doing that, it can insert itself through the skin with less pressure. So we're developing smart needles. In fact, Imperial are developing smart needles to be able to do this. So it, so it causes less pain and less hassle to the patient. Also, the mosquito mouth part is not, it's not um, solid. It can flex and bend throughout it. It can be manipulated. So within the skin, it is able to move round till it finds an appropriate capillary. Now this is quite funky and quite creepy at the same time. But again, the idea of being able to move needles round past delicate or very sensitive pieces of tissue within our bodies is a very clever idea. So the next time a mosquito is biting on you, just have a little like moment of not biting, obviously, you're piercing and sucking you. Have a little moment and think about what's going on here. But there are a lot of pollinators and a lot of these have developed mouth parts to enable them to um, get pollen within a plant that they've co-evolved with. So they have got very special adaptations. And this, this plant, this uh, Megasteranchus uh, longirostris, it's a great name for a long fly, um, it has co-evolved with about eight plants in South Africa. And so that it's the only one that can pollinate them. Now, Unlike butterflies and moths, they can't curl up their mouth parts. So what this thing has to do when it's not feeding, because it obviously can't fly along like that, it actually uh, folds underneath. Uh, it's kind of got its corrugated slip underneath so it can fly along like that. Oh look, I haven't talked about a flirty fly in it, oh at least a second. So here's another example of a fly that has actually got its cheeks, it's developed into these antlets. So we call these the moose flies. And again, there's quite a lot of examples of flies that have got these amazing modifications. We see so many different sex, sec, uh, secondary sexual characteristics on flies in comparison to adults. And finally, we've got the antennae. Now these are the ears of the animal. These are how they, uh, they're able to pick up all the vibrations and convert these uh, vibrations into chemicals uh, and they're able to tell what's going on where. Now we don't quite understand what's going on with all the antennae. We've got a lot of variation going on. For example, on the top left, we've got these amazing paddles in this spider killing fly. Why it's got paddles, we don't know. The top right, this is a parasite fly. It's, it's tiny and it has to be very good at locating its host for its larvae. So it's got some of the best antennae. But my favorite, Ha <laughs> the boys on the bottom left. So these are very, very primitive type of flies. These are the net wing flies. And the males live very short lives, as do the females when they're adults. But they territory guard over streams. And he doesn't just use his antennae for listening out. He uses it to face. So it's like, this is my territory. It's like dancing art. You cannot come closer to me than this. And they are huge in comparison to the body size. So those are all the sensory organs on the head, but flies being flies, they don't just have that on their head. This is uh, uh, Omea ochrysia, and again, it's another parasite. So it's a tiny, like we said before. And now this, this female, she has to find a, a very fast moving host for her larvae. And at this host is quite small, and she's very small, but she's developed something very special because of it. So you see that hole on the side of the thorax, that's a spiracle where they breathe in air. 
Below that, you can see a segment that looks like a tangerine or an orange segment. Now that are its ears. So it's now got shoulder pads that it can listen through. So it can pinpoint this sound much more accurately because it is able to amplify the noise coming at it to enable it to triangulate where that host is. Now, clever people, not me, but very clever people have gone, you know what, that's fantastic. And again, they started thinking about developing hearing aids, very, very tiny hearing aids. We are now making little loudspeakers of this. So it's another way that these flies, because of their um, odd behavior, because of their amazing ability to find food, we were able to actually use it for our own purpose. The legs. Legs are not just for walking. Oh no, they're also used for flirting. And flies are one of the groups of insects or uh, of uh, animals that produce silk. And a lot of them will use this silk to wrap up presents that we call nuptial gifts. So they don't just use silk, a lot of them will use saliva. Very pleasant thought. But they are quite funky. It's not just the actual uh, silk producing that is a uh, sexual uh, selective category, but actually the presence of these silk glands or not. This is a new species of these dance flies that's been described. And some of the males have it on one, some of it have it on the other, some of it have it on both, and some of it have none. So there's obviously a difference whether there is a gain or net loss to whether it's an um, advantage for the individual to have it. This is a, an example of another set of legs. Arguably, I love these legs because they're mantis. You can see why they're called mantis. They're raptorial. Now, this little lady is a fantastic predator. She is very, very hard. And what I love about her and what a lot of people love about her is that she likes nothing more than fishing out mosquito larvae. So we're actually thinking about using these for biological control in areas where there's lots of mosquitoes that are detrimental. Wings. Wings are what flies are known for. Obviously, there's some flies that don't have wings, but this is a great example of a fly that does. And he's the New Zealand cannibal fly. Don't know why he's got that name, because he's not a cannibal. Uh, in fact, he's really closely related to a house fly. But he, again, has got these massive exaggerated wings that males generally do. But flies are known for flying, and some of the best flyers are these hoverflies. And uh, there's a brilliant who works with you lot, Professor Crap, and he's been coming in. He's doing amazing work looking at hoverflies, uh, putting them in wind tunnels, studying all sorts of things with them. And he's working out how the vision and, and the, the information uh, are gained from the vision and how it is, uh, the, it is uh, transported to the wings and how they can control flies. And this is really useful because he's actually looking at how we can improve supercomputers and things like this to enable a better technology when it comes to our own planes. So we're not just using it for planes, we're actually using it for the development of nanobots, small microbots. In fact, there's a uh, bee bots, which are actually based on flies that are called bee bots, very annoying, on their way to Mars. So they're yeah, using them to get into situations where we can't because their ability to fly is absolutely extraordinary but their ability to hover is really quite a unique thing for them to do. Bristles. Now, if you, anyone who studies flies knows that bristles are a right pain because we use them to identify what a fly is, but often they will fall out. And so you're looking for holes that maybe once showed the presence of a bristle. Now, this is quite nice on a fly that's maybe a centimetre and a half long, but we get flies on average like three millimetres. It gets jumping. But bristles, we know, have a role. What that role is, we're not quite sure in most of the cases. Uh, a lot of them are embedded in pits that are sensory, whether they're mechanical, chemical, whatever. We know that these pits uh, are, are doing some sort of function for the fly. Now, the body is not just covered in bristles. The actual skeleton is covered in hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons are unique to that species, that specimen, and the age of that specimen. So as it gets older, the chemistry changes, the hydrocarbons change, and flies use it to smell out whether a mate is out of a potential age or, or how good that diet is, etc., etc. So it's all sorts of exciting things. But it's not just for the flies to help each other out. The bristles and the hydrocarbons work very well in a very special species. This is a scuba diving fly. 
Now, in the UK, we have lots of scuba diving insects. Yep, there's lots of other beetles that we know which have this plastron. So this is a bubble of um, air. So they're able to scuba dive around and then they can um, fill it up again when they go to the surface. So there's nothing totally unusual about that. But what is unusual is this fly lives in the mono lakes of California. And this is arguably the most saline environment out. Because as the waters come down off the mountain and they get into the lake, there's no way for them to go. There is no output from this lake. So as evaporation happens, the water gets more and more concentrated. Now this disturbs uh, the salinity, this disturbs the salinity, disturbs the hydrocarbons, this plastron uh, layer with most diving insects who do this. So they can't. In fact, there's hardly any animals that are able to live in this environment. Not these flies. Physicists, I love it because I had to read a lot of very complicated papers, thank you physicists, uh, were well, looked at how this fly, and it enters the water at a specific angle, which enables this bubble to form. Thanks to the unique chemistry and the, the bristles, it's able to go down, and she goes down with such pressure that once she gets to the bottom and she lays her legs, she just poof, and just flies out again. Really, really quite cool. But what I find incredibly cool, if you look closely at the photo, you'll see that her eye is not covered. So how on earth she has managed this, how on earth you can have this so you don't have that, um, it doesn't cover, I don't know, but it's absolutely marvellous. So there's a little task for you lot. We move on to the abdomen, and it arguably, apart from the exciting genitalia, it's quite boring to look at in some ways, because a lot of it's going on the inside. So this is where the guts are, this is where a lot of those uh, the ovaries are, but it's also where their kidneys are, the Malthigian tubules. And in most of them, this is, these work normally, but in a few creatures, such as this keriplatid, which is a type of fungus gnat, they bioluminesce. Obviously, their, their chemistry is so different, the enzymes they use are different to the other animals that bioluminesce. And these are nasty, nasty predators. I love the fact that this midge larvae is really quite bad. So what it does, it creates, uh, it bioluminesces in the kidneys. It says, come here. Um, it's in a cave. And it also releases these balls. These are really quite nasty chemicals that they will basically dissolve any insect that is stuck on them. And grant, so they're partially digesting the insect before they kind of fish, uh, reel in the insect for them to eat. They are so territorial as well. If another one comes near them, they will start to try and attack and eat back. But they're brilliant. If anyone's ever been to the caves in New Zealand to see this, my mother has, and I'm still very jealous because I need to get over and see them. But no good dipterist can talk about flies without mentioning genitalia. Um, you Pretty much any pub conversation gets onto genitalia within seconds. And it's not because we're weird. It's because most of the species description will go on genitalia. It is the, it is the structure that it, uh, alters quickest um, in terms of uh, uh, evolutionary scales. So we know that when we're comparing the genitalia, we may be comparing different species. So it is quite functional. Now the males are very obvious, uh, most of the time external genitalia or easily um, got out, as it were. And the females are always ignored. It is a really depressing time in the pub when there all these men are sitting around me going, oh, female genitalia is just so dull. And I'm like, oh. But there is one group of flies where it isn't, and it's these canopids. And she has an amazing ovipositor. And canopids, their common name, are bee grabbers or wasp grabbers. And as, as the name says, she does exactly that. And then with what looks like a tin opener, she will fly through the thorax to lay her eggs in for her larvae. So she has genitalia that is so different and so amazingly sculptured, we can ID it. But look at that. Boys will always outbeat the girls on this. And these are arguably some of the funniest and weirdest penis, or adiagus, as we would say, um, that you'll probably see in the animal kingdom. They look like those little uh, machines that you'd have in doctor surgeries that buzz every time you hit the metal side. They're utterly complicated. Most of them are internal. They're whipped out at the end, as it were. But um, what is going on is that obviously inside the female, there's a lot happening. 
So they're beginning to look at this uh, male-female conflict a lot more in flies. We've been studying them a lot. And one of the ones we work on is Drosophila. Because Drosophila melanogaster is obviously the model organism. But Drosophila melanogaster, as with most Drosophila, have what we call megasperm. Now, it's three millimeters long. Its sperm is one millimeter long, which you would be like, that's not long. Well, that's a thousand times the length of a human sperm. But it's nothing in comparison to this one. Drosophila bifurca, this again, three millimeters long. You can see the little adult there. And what you see occurred around it is just one sperm. It has one sperm at a time, and it has the length of 5.8 centimeters, which is truly extraordinary. In fact, if that was uh, an equivalent, if we want a, a, a comical equivalent with humans, that would be the size of a blue whale, just to kind of give you an example. Now, they don't have millions like humans, but they will have hundreds at the most. So they are much more careful, but they have created <laughs> quite extraordinary things because they have to compete with other sperm inside the female. She is designed to take the best sperm and only keep the best sperm. So the males are always trying to fight inside with them. And this has all led to some extraordinary adaptations. So from the head, from the thorax, the abdomen, the wings, the legs, everything has produced some of the weirdest and wonderful animals on the planet. And they're a little bit biased, but it's true. So for example, this is a coronamid. This is a non-biting midge. This is found in the ocean. So first of all, people don't talk about flies or insects in the ocean. And there's a lot, actually. Now, this was modified. Its, first, its wings, as you see here, they're no longer used for wings. So he uses them for paddles because the adult male emerges to the surface of the sea and then he rows around on it with his paddle. He's got these really long front legs and he's got this really long antennae and he's using these to sense where the female is, to feel for vibration because she's even weirder because she doesn't even change into an adult form. He basically resembles a larval form but with developed genitalia. And it is this that she pokes through the surface of the ocean. So what this poor male has to do is row around the surface of the ocean looking for genitalia. Now, that seems quite nuanced at the best, but he is only an adult for two and a half hours and she is only an adult for half an hour. So you've got some extraordinary adaptations going on. So that was a quick whisk through some of the stories that are in the book and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, some of the people that joined uh, late uh, haven't switched on their videos. If they'd like to do that, we're very welcome. A um, couple, of, couple of thoughts, uh, Erica. One is how many flies do we estimate we know about and how many flies that are still waiting to be discovered? <laughs> okay. Approximately. Um, okay, well, okay, so far we think there's about 170,000 species described. Okay, which puts them in the top four groups of animals described. Uh, Coleoptera the beetles are number one, but that's due generally, I think, because of a legacy, because they were very trendy. So they've tried to extrapolate and um, work came out a couple of years ago in Canada where they started looking at museum collections um, and Malay samples. So these are tent traps that they put all around Canada. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to see whether the estimate for what they think they had and how many species they've got and how it relates to museum collections was correct. So they worked out uh, using these and they were like, for all the other insects, yeah, pretty cool. Their estimates and what they have and what they think is going to happen and how many more is like, yeah. And then they got to flies and they went, yeah, we've massively underestimated how many species of fly we think there are because there's way more in here than we started off. And it's specifically in one family, they went, oh dear, we've got a little bit of a problem here. And these are in Sestamides, which are gall midges. And they worked out so they estimated, I think it was, they, they, were, they had a couple of hundred described in their country and they estimated there was actually um, 1,800. 
but some that were species. But then they extrapolated the Canadian fauna out to the global fauna, uh, working on how many species described in what countries and how many species we think so far. And they estimated the total number of cessids was 1.8 million. Yeah. Now, yes, Diff we're going to need a bigger building. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's going to be that much. I, I can't believe it, and my little heart can't cope if it's going to be that much. But we do know that we have millions, probably millions of species of flies to go. But sadly, we know that more and more are becoming extinct before we're even getting around to naming them. And and you you mentioned that uh, the mosquito um, needle to get the blood. Did you say that that was that technology was being developed by people to, to use yeah. to use that? Yeah, so there's a guy who's he's looking at the ovipositors of wasps and the mouth parts of needles. In fact, loads of people all around the world are doing all of this um, because they are so good at penetrating without harming. So they're looking at all and, and also so there's a, a, a numenoid. It's a, a wood wasp. And it is a, it's, it's basically, it's tiny, but it has this massive ovipositor, an egg laying tube, that it is able to penetrate wood and sense where a, a grub, a beetle grub, is in the wood. Wow. For us, exactly. So for, uh, for needles to sniff, like, as it were, <laughs> sniff out where they're going, this is an extraordinary bit of technology if we can get it right. Thank you. Uh, well, one or two uh, people have asked questions. Um, oh, who says? Okay. <laughs> I was saying Mike Reffers says that I can't use my video unless I send the link to my other computer. Well, I hope you enjoyed the talk and we could see uh, Erica, uh, uh, Mike. Um, we've got the discount code up on, on the web there in the chat uh, pages. Um, and somebody remarked, uh, Max H Whit Whitby is looking Who's for Max? <laughs> Where is Max? He wants to get rid of the flies. Flies are your friend. Um, um, my advice is to prevent them coming in in the first place. Now, we've been using flies as detectives for thousands of years. They can sniff out a dead body from kilometers away. So you, you humans, no offense, you're all quite smelly. I mean, I'm smelly. We have to accept it. It's something... So they will get in um, unless there's a really good physical barrier. So physical barrier, number one. Number two, if you're going to catch them, get a carp to go slowly because they don't process that as movement in the same way because it's too slow for them. So they're like, uh, so you can do that. But Or you could just watch them because they're quite fascinating. You can work out what they are, though. Yeah. How, how, I, um, how, how does a, nor a, a normal... A normal person that isn't a a, a, a fly person. person. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks>. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> how, um, how how do they set about identifying the flies that are coming into their okay? Kitchens? You're predominantly only going to get a few species coming in. Although there's a lovely piece of work that came out of Los Angeles looking at urban fly, urban insects. There's way more than we think, which is it's uh, the average person might find a bit creepy, but I think it's brilliant. Uh, really good keys. Uh, there, somebody's asked how many species of fly in the UK. There's over 7,000. So there's a lot. Uh, there's only 4,000 beetles in the UK. In fact, there's only 6,100 mammals in the world. So you have got a task on you. But the Dipsis Forum, um, you can become a member really cheaply, eight pounds, eight pounds. And that gives you access to loads of really easy keys. And nowadays, we also have the advantage of these these little phones. We're able to take really good high-resolution images. And for people who don't want to do the work through keys and IDs, there's a, like apps called things like iNaturalist, and they help us identify. And that's beneficial in many ways if, because we're also taking the data. So we're now seeing where the populations of different species are, which is great. So... In, in being nosy about a species of fly, you're actually giving us data to help us look after it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we've got a question about the photograph with the with the uh, eye. And, right. Uh, Louise uh, Kerberu there. Did the right. eye photo have hairs from the compound eye? And if so, 
Why? So the eyes, the omatidium themselves do not have the hairs. The hairs are in between the eye facets. Why they have them, they're, the reason we don't know. Uh, because a lot of them is, is it's very good because you don't want to obviously obscure the vision. So you, you have that as a protective barrier, etc. If that's the case, then why don't all flies have that? So we can give you a few examples of what we think, but as of yet, we haven't got any any real idea what's going on. A lot of work to do, isn't there? Uh, I think that's what's the really scary bit is, you know, we've been, I mean, even the fact that we've been working on their genes for 100 years and we've still only barely scratched the surface. And we've been working on their morphology for 300 years, but we're only beginning now to understand and link the pair together. We have so much work. Right. Um, so uh, lovely to hear someone talking about such passion about this subject. Great talk from Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank uh, you. Max agrees. Fantastic talk. Um, Thanks, Max. And we've uh, we've talked about Janet Gibson's questions. Um, Richard Outhwaite, when did flies first appear? Wow, that's an interesting one. We, and that's after Colin, who talks about what mechanics of of a fly have been applied to aviation and aeronautics. Well, you uh, mentioned okay, one of those I don't know, I don't flies. Know. Right, so flies were the first animals in space. Okay, Drosophila melanogaster went up in a rocket in 1947 and has basically been going up ever since. In fact, we got colonies up in the space station. Because this is the model organism. We've been using it to understand our own genetics and all sorts of things. But what we're doing with it in space is understanding circadian rhythms and how space impacts on that. So this is one of the things when we're talking about long haul flights to Mars and things like that, we're actually testing out a lot of the things on flies. Uh, one of the more amusing things I heard was that they sent 13 flies into space. because They wanted to look at the impact of reproduction. And I think several thousand came back down. So obviously that didn't impact on the little fly. So we've been actually. <laughs> I, know, it didn't, I think it was. Only I was like, going to say, did their private parts get bigger because they're in space in, in um, zero gravity? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I haven't actually seen any images. I have a bad enough reputation in the museum. I think I'm not allowed to probably do that. But uh, right. there's there's lots of ways that we're we're looking at the the impact of gene uh, impact of space on their genes, etc. But we also um, the mechanics of flight is also quite helpful for us. Um, when did flies first appear? Right. The problem is, is the, the larval stage is not as sclerotized, so they haven't got such a hardened exoskeleton. So they don't preserve well most of the time. So the earliest larval, um, earliest flies as such is, I think, 260 million years ago. Now, these are still what we'd call, if we were looking at the whole spectrum of flies, they're still quite advanced flies. These are like Drosophila, um, not Drosophila, um, Dolichopodids. So they're not our most primitive flies. So we still think there's a little, we can go a little bit earlier, but 260 million years is our fossil evidence at the moment. Thank you. How does such a large sperm fit in a small fly? <laughs> you know what? When I told press, and they were like, what do you mean it's 5.8 centimetres? You got that wrong. And I know, no, trust me. And they're like, but, um, but, um, but, um, I said, it's very, very thin. And what they do it is it's rolled up into a messy ball. And they basically have a pea shooter for their genitalia. And so they will fire out one sperm at a time. So they're not like humans and waste thousands in, in, a, in a, an event. Well, they are very careful and only one at a time. Right. Have we got uh, any more questions from anybody? Anybody like right to wave their hand? If we can see them all. Well, I, I'm going to thank you, Erica, for a fantastic run through. And uh, I hope you sold lots and lots of copies of the book. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you. And perhaps everybody could uh, unmute themselves and give you a clap <laughs> of an applause. Thank you, Peg. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Thank you. And uh, just to say that um, 
Uh, we've got another talk coming up on the 5th of November uh, when one of our previous speakers, again, another previous speaker, uh, Sanjeev Gupta will be talking about uh, Mars and the rovers on, on Mars and what evidence we've got so far of ancient life on Mars. Um, and then on the uh, uh, 17th of November, uh, there's a panel uh, which uh, Bill Blackburn has organized on uh, uh, becoming I human, the next generation of neural interfaces, which should be, and he's got a, a collection of um, extremely erudite speakers, and that's going to be a great, uh, a great evening. Uh, just to say that uh, Sanjeev Gupta is talking at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, because of other commitments, I understand, and the I human uh, discussion will take place at six o'clock on the 17th of November. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again and um, keep safe. Thank you.